world, nobody stops you from doing a PV if you've counseled the parents well and told them that this is a very important examination for us to know whether medicines will help her or not help her to get her menstruation. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. If you, her parents are very concerned. Yes. So now you have examined the patient and you know that there is no vagina and probably there's no uterus also. <laughs> what do you tell them? How do you break the news? Uh, Ma'am, we uh, break the news to the patient. <laughs> We have to take them into the conference. We have to uh, explain all the causes. Make sure that there is no one else in the OPD. Yes, Make sure that the parents are able to take the news. You know, I've seen many parents collapsing in front of me when we tell them that your girl cannot menstruate and will not be able to reproduce. It is a very devastating news for a parent to hear. <clears throat> and in fact, in such a case where vagina is also not formed, they know that her whole life is like sort of in a turmoil. So it is very important that a senior person explains out of whoever the team is. <clears throat> One person or two persons alone should sit with the patient's parents and then explain it. What do you do now for her? Does she, she need HRT? What will you do? Does she? Uh, how will she get reproduction? First, tell me, does she need HRT or not? No, ma'am, she no, does not. Her hormonal is correct. Not. Why does she not re need HRT? Ma'am, because ma she has properly functioning ovaries and hormonal function is normal, so she will not need an HRT. Correct. Then, uh, what is the mode of reproduction in these girls? Uh, Ma'am, they have uh, option of uh, they have adoption. Uh, they have option in of uh, these days there is uterine tra transplantation surgeries are also mentioned, but they have to go for surrogacy with their own ovum. Yeah, their own. in our country, how easy is surrogacy now? <clears throat> it's now, quite sir. difficult because it is altruistic only, but yet there is a way to have surrogacy for such girls if they get permission from the appropriate authority. Yeah, Tanya, any questions? We can start with other cases of amenorrhea. Now, this case you've discussed well, I think. <clears throat> so, no need of HRT. You will have to reassure, re-reassure the parents every time they come that no medicines are going to help. You can do her hormones more than once to yes. reassure yourself and also. And repeat to the imaging and we also help. Yeah. And once once she wants to get married, how would you go ahead with this patient's management? Uh, Ma'am, when they decide to uh, plan a marriage, then we go for a vaginoplasty two months prior to the planned marriage. Uh, okay. <clears throat> what are the methods of vaginoplasty in these girls? Ma'am, they might be making those uh, operation in which we uh, create a space between bladder and rectum and then we uh, suture them with the introitus and the mold is placed inside uh, the mold and also a partial thickness skin graft can be uh, applied over the mold. Mold mm -hmm. might be of glass or rubber or... Which spot. part of the ingraft is kept on the outer side and which is towards the mold? Ma'am, the row surface is kept on the outer side. And, Correct. Uh, very good. <clears throat> what are the other methods? Uh, Ma'am, we can do laparoscopic Davidoff methods. Uh, mm -hmm. in which we can mobilize the peritoneum and Pero uh, it is brought to the uh, perineum and sutured to the uh, rectum uh, by uh, perineal dissection and then mold is placed in uh, them as well. Yeah. And what is another method? Third method? Ma'am, there is amnion vaginoplasty. No, amnion and skin graft are two are things that can be used in your mechanisms. The Chetis method of uh, vaginoplasty. What is it? Uh, Ma'am, it is a two step uh, procedure in which first we do a laparotomy. We have a traction device and we have an olive. So the olive is taken <coughs> over the peritoneum and traction sutures are uh, taken extra peritoneally and then mm. close the abdomen and then. Um, 
the uh, we go for with the with with fraction, fraction exactly. uh, till the olive creates a space mm -hmm. apart from this if the patient says i'm not ready to undergo any surgical procedure what can you advise her mechanical dilatation uh, how how do you advise it uh, <clears throat> advise the patient to we teach them how to do it with a vaginal dilator and then they have to do it daily after yeah how often does she have to use the dilator for how long um she has to use it to she becomes sexually active and it starts at a young age. She has to use it initially twice a day for at least 20 minutes every time to be able to. And this is not very simple because it is a painful process for the little child. Okay, now suppose she had an intact vagina and she had a uterus, cervix, and she was primary amenorrhic. What... <clears throat> How would you know what type of amenorrhea is this? Can you please I did not hear it. I'm saying if she was primary amenorrhic and she had a normal vagina, normal cervix, normal uterus, how would you find out what are the what are the types of amenorrhea you know and how would you find out? Um, I'm primary and secondary amenorrhea. Uh, if we divide it by the I'm marks. talking about primary amenorrhea. Your patient is primary, primary amenorrhic. Primary amenorrhea. We divide it mm. in four compartments. Uh, the mm. compartment four includes hypothalamic causes. Uh, it includes uh, inherited mm. conditions, includes <clears throat> Kaplan syndrome, uh, and also any. Uh, Just give me broad classifications. Which classification do we follow? How do you categorize your patient into a broad group? Ma'am, hypogonadotropic <coughs> hypogonadism, new gonadotropic hypogonadism, and uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. In hypergonadotropic... Give it in plain words. One is hypogonadotropic amenorrhea. Another one is <clears throat> normogonadotropic amenorrhea. Mm -hmm. And the third one is hypergonadotropic amenorrhea. Correct? Yes, Which one are the treatables among them? Ma'am, mm -hmm. hypergonadotropic uh, amenorrhea is treatable as well as hypogonadotropic amenorrhea. As amenable to treatment. Hypergonadotropic is treatable? Ma'am, uh, we can give uh, them gonadotropin uh, uh, for ovulation. When we say treatable regarding ovulation, which are the ones where you can induce ovulation for her? Hypogonadotropic. Or dusra normo ya hypergonadotropic just me PCOS aata. Now tell me what classification system is this? WHO classification. Right. When was WHO classification system? In which year was it coined? First presented. Liko, 1973 May it was first coined. And it was group 1, group 2, group 3. Group 1 was at that time hormone estimations were not possible. So <clears throat> they took pituitary and hypothalamic gonadotropic uh, uh, dysfunction altogether. Group 2 was where they found that urinary and serum gonadotropines were in the normal range and yet the patient was amenorrhic. And the last one was where there was no endogenous estrogen activity. But this was at a time when very few hormone assays were done. Then after that, they came to WHO classification in 1976 which were seven groups. That was abolished very fast because that was mainly on prolactin. But then they came to a modified WHO classification, which was done in 1993. So these three important dates are there. The most important is 73 and 93. Right? Okay. So the, the classification which we follow today is 93. Classification. classification, right? Where you say group one is hypothalamic pituitary failure low gonadotropins, low estradiol. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. Number two is hypothalamic pituitary ovarian dysfunction. Now, this is not hypofunction. This is not hyperfunction. 
it is dysfunction and this has the pcos category as the largest group right then comes group 3 where there is ovarian failure and hence always there would be high gonadotropins and low estradiol levels correct what is figo classification anyone knows about it the new figo classification system which they are trying to develop no it is good if you know about it this is uh, done in a very uh, different way and what they've done here is that they have made type 1 is hypothalamic type 2 is pituitary type 3 is ovarian and they put pcos in a different category because they said that you know pcos is hypo p correct sunena so luxury i'm very happy that you've written this is known as hypo p now hypo is hypothalamic pituitary ovarian and p is pcos so they've not put pcos into the category of classification because this is the largest group and most of the patients belong to it so they've still maintained the older criteria of diagnosing pcos and in hypo p they try to differentiate between hypothalamus pituitary and ovarian causes and their only plea is that in ovarian we were taking only ovarian failure what happened if there was luteal phase defect what happened if there was luteinized unruptured follicle nothing you know was clarified so they said no ovarian pathology should be separate but there are a lot of criticism also for this hypo p diagnosis which says that and what do they use they use acronyms because itne sare causes they diye in every there would be a genetic autoimmune iatrogenic neoplasm which makes it g a i n is the acronym for hypothalamus for pituitary there are three things it could be functional it could be infectious inflammatory trauma so they made pi uh, i fit f i t as acronym then for the ovarian they said physiological idiopathic and endocrine so they made it as p i e so they said isse yaad rahega but lot of criticism is going on for this this was made very recently in uh, when was this made i think this was made in around 2018 2019 but it has still not gained momentum because it's a difficult thing to remember they say in here you can just say this is h this is p this is o and in h this is g h and g means genetic hypothalamic you understand this is how they say p it is f p functional or p infection you know this is how they say that we can pinpoint the diagnosis but it is a difficult classification still not accepted by all and they use a acronym like they use for a lot of things made by the uh, britishers mainly and uh, <clears throat> what else so you will be still follow the old who classification which was coined in 93 93 because it is sometimes very difficult to separate hypothalamus from pituitary and know whether the cause lies in the hypothalamus or in the pituitary so it is easiest to say hypothalamic pituitary i want you all to tell me what is the drug given if you find a hypothalamic deficiency for ovulation and what drug can be given if you find a deficiency in the pituitary for inducing ovulation Gonadotropins. Gonadotropins will work in both. Gonadotropins will work in hypogonadotropins. Hypo, all both the hypothalamic and pituitary deficiency. Hypo gonadotropins will work. What will work if there is hypothalamic deficiency? Ma'am, gonadotropins releasing a hormone. A hormone. Excellent. Very good. So, if there is a deficiency in hypothalamus and there is no pulsatile release of GnRH, then pulsatile uh, uh, administration of gnrh which is done by a pump is what is advocated like you've seen now so many things one sees blood sugar levels by applying a pump similarly a subcutaneous thin needle needle goes in and you apply a pump and it can be worn for 6 months also from where a small pulse of uh, the hypothalamic pulsatile hormone will go will be released and that will stimulate the pituitary to make gonadotropin and lead to ovulation but it is not generally used because it takes 
uh, weeks and months also to induce ovulation. Gonadotropin is a much faster and more definitive way of inducing ovulation in hypothalamic pituitary, hypothalamic pituitary amenorrhea's. This is all about ovulation. Any other questions, Tanya, you would want to take up? Shweta is there. Any questions you all want to use? Ask. I think there was also a question about whether with the malarial, which the chromosome and a study still be done. I think there's answer. There can always be a mixture. It doesn't have to be a pure, just one anomaly. Sometimes there's a combination of factors. And when you're doing a workup, you must do a complete workup. Correct. And again, simplest thing, simple, like in everything you said in your history and testing, a simple UPT. Please also mention that because I think that's the simplest mm -hmm. thing that we look at. Yours was pretty straightforward. You did an examination. You said blind vagina, but also simple things first. Yes, yeah, in um, karyotype, what are the problems you could find? What are the conditions where you would get a diagnosis in doing a karyotype of the girl? Ma'am, for uh, androgen insensitive, complete androgen insensitivity. Yes, this is the most important. Mm -hmm. And if you get this, how do you proceed in this case? Mm -hmm. Because here also you would have a blind vagina, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh? And um, there are two types in one. You will have a uterus in the other. You will not have uterus. What are the two types of androgen insensitivity where you will have the uterus and not have? What are the names of the two syndromes? That, um, one is uh, complete androgen sensitivity syndrome yeah. where we will not have complete uterus. Uh, or uterus. maybe no uterus. Yeah. Okay. And what is the other one? And the other is partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, which is also known as Diefenstein syndrome, where we will have a uh, uterus. Okay. Any other? Anything which is not probably... Achha, androgen uh, insensitivity syndrome, may what karyotypic abnormality will you find? Important Apart from finding an XY chromosome on karyotype, where is the receptor placed which leads to androgen insensitivity? In which chromosome? In the X chromosome of the XY. Correct? In the X chromosome of the XY, uh, the receptor is placed and it is that which leads to androgen insensitivity. The androgen is produced from the SRY region and this receptor is not sensitive and hence nothing, no organs respond to that testosterone. Mm -hmm. And hence as basic development is of the female, so the female characteristics develop. But mm -hmm. the uterus is either a bud or there is no bud. The other syndrome where the uterus develops is Swire's syndrome. Swire's syndrome. Right in yes. Swire syndrome, there is a uterus, but uh, yes. gonads are of mixed yes. genetic material. Yes. In Swire's, also in testicular feminization. So, how do you proceed in these girls? Because your girl could have been a XY, uh, I mean, could be, a, could be a testicular feminization also, if she could have been, even yes. with a little deeper or shallow vagina. In yes. that case, you would have done a karyotyping and you would have found. Because they could have an absent uterus even in that, but then the gonads are also smaller and their hormones are on the higher side, especially the gonadotropins. But because your hormones were normal, you straight away said it is Rock Rockintansky Kustner Hossa syndrome. If the hormones were slightly high, karyotype, like Dr. Tanya said, is a very important investigation in all these children. And what would you do if if you find that, yes, there is testicular feminization or swires? How do you proceed with these girls? Ma'am, we do a bilateral gonadectomy at 18 to 20 years of age because they have a 30% risk. In which case you do at 18 to 20 and in which case you would do right away when you diagnose? In sensitivity syndrome, we will do it at 18 to 20 years of age and then syndrome, we will do it as soon as possible. Very good. Don't know exact bull reho. Very good. Why do you do it earlier in Swire syndrome and why later in testicular feminization? 
in testicular fertilization syndrome the estrogen uh, there is peripheral conversion of testosterone to estrogen which helps in breast development very good very good that is why we do it uh, after the after achieving uh, puberty That's okay it. and in spires there is a higher risk of there is higher risk of conversion of tumors there is higher risk of tumors in the ovary also in spires yes ma'am spires mein kya hota hai sir why region absent hai ya present hai और टेस्टिकुलर फेमनाइजेशन में प्रेजेंट होता है उससे टेस्टोस्टेरोन बनता है बनता है लेकिन उसमें वो रिसेप्टर्स नहीं है जिससे कि वो एक्ट कर सके पेरिफरी में करेक्ट सो सो वेरी गुड यू ऑल नो दिस टॉपिक सो वेल मुझे तो और क्वेश्चन ही नहीं आ रहे हैं तुमसे पूछने को आई थिंक यू बोथ है तानिया यू आर स्टिल देयर भैया और पूछो इनसे कांट यू यू कैन स्पीक अगेन वी कांट हियर यू तानिया लिटिल बेटर लिटिल बेटर Can't hear you at all. Do you have any other case to present, Nikita? No. Do you have any other case to present, Bita? Uh, no, ma'am. I just uh, took one case only. दोनों के नाम बताओ अपने मैंने गलत नाम बोला नहीं मैम आई एम निकिता आई एम आई एम रितुश्री यू आर रितुश्री ओके क्या व्हाट इज द चैट क्वेश्चन व्हिच इज कमिंग अप आई वाज जस्ट सीइंग देयर वाज अ क्वेश्चन ओके कैन यू एम्फसाइज ऑन प्राइमरी एमेनोरिया विद एक्स 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 सिंड्रोम चलो एम्फसाइज नाउ यू गॉट अ क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस ट्रिपल एक्स सिंड्रोम के बारे में कुछ जानते हो हेलो हाँ ट्रिपल एक्स डज इट ऑलवेज प्रेजेंट विद प्राइमरी एमिनोरिया और विद नॉर्मल मेंसेस आल्सो इट डजेंट प्रेजेंट विद प्राइमरी एमिनोरिया नॉर्मली इट प्रेजेंट्स विद अर्ली ओवेरियन फेलियर सो व्हेन यू फाइंड गर्ल्स विद um say getting amenorrheic or oligomenorrheic with scanty um uh, with a very low ovarian reserve at the age in 30s or in early 40s then we do karyotype to find out whether there's triple x or there is turners mosaic or if there is um uh, what is it ftr the the fragile x syndrome we rule out these three only is there mental retardation in women with um, फ्रजाइल एक्स सिंड्रोम नो वेमेन एस्केप इट मेन हैव इट मेन हैव इट बिकॉज़ द मेडिसिन इज इन एक्स सो या व्हाई बिकॉज़ दे हैव ओनली वन एंड इफ देयर इज फ्रजाइल एक्स इन मेन देन दे प्रेजेंट विद स्ट्रोंगर सिंड्रोम्स सिम्टम्स वेयर एज इफ देयर इज अ फ्रजाइल एक्स इन वेमेन दे हैव द अदर एक्स टू प्रोटेक्ट देम so they don't pre present with mental retardation i mean mental uh, retardation symptoms but they present with early menopause similarly a triple x will also present with early menopause poi and similarly a mosaic turners will also otherwise the turners can also present with amenorrhea right away theek hai so in your case your differential diagnosis for me would have been uh, rockentansky kusner hasse syndrome it could have been a test Organization and it could have been a um, uh, Swire syndrome. Okay, Swire syndrome has a normal vagina, so you rule it out right away. Testicular feminization has a closed vagina; it doesn't have a open vagina. Maybe deeper, maybe shallow. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. बस तो ये दोनों तुम्हारी differential diagnosis में जाते हैं, and then karyotype would have. Clinched. Okay. And that's the sound scan where you see normal ovaries. You see the uterus well developed. And Rockentansky may be uterus could develop. करना वो करना possible नहीं है. And similarly in uh, testicular feminization also you cannot develop the uterus. 
testicular feminization mein ovaries are smaller they are misplaced they are higher placed and in uh, rockintansky the ovaries are also high placed they are not normally placed they are at the pelvic brim and what other anomalies can accompany this ियलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलोलो
there's no timing of the cycle but would you do it any time of the day would you do it morning when would you want to do the test evening um, in, in the morning morning why are most hormonal tests done in the morning uh, ma'am uh, the for uh, uh, hpo axis is so ma'am cortisol levels are the highest in the morning uh, they have the peak they they have the peak they achieve the peak early in the morning that is throughout the day they go on decreasing and so, so the normal values in normal values in adult females is generally 2 i would say 2 2 to 10 nanogram per ml it is generally less than 2 but suppose it is between 2 to 10 then you do another test which is a augmentin test where you augment the production you increase the uh, acth production so that this pathway is all stimulated and more 17 hydroxy progesterone is produced so it suddenly jumps up 10 times then you say that the acth augmentation test is positive so these are two things which you need to do um i i need to read the i can't remember that very well if someone remembers 
um, the augmentin test is what 0.25 ACTH is given or 2.5 ACTH is given. And after one hour, we look for 17 hydroxy progesterone again. And um, if we find it's jumped up by three times. If it's ye lena theek se, I think you need to read it well. And the treatment after that. Ma'am, ma'am, we will give exogenous uh, steroids. Uh, With steroids. You give steroids when they are not wanting to get pregnant. But when they want to get pregnant, you treat them like PCOS only. You have to give ovulation induction and we do not have generally now any role of giving these steroids to the mother who's pregnant all that is changed now because only it is an autosomal recessive condition and if the father is also autosomal recessive then we have to investigate and see look for the baby if that is a, a baby which has the same syndrome then we need to uh, introduce some hormones otherwise nothing is needed because if only mother is um positive and the father is not, no treatment is to be given to these mothers during pregnancy, which we used to study earlier, but then later on with more investigations and as time passed, we found out that it has a genetic connect. So I think you all can read about CAH in a different uh, class altogether. It's a very, very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Ye Units alag hongi jisne bhi padha hai. Because nanograms, mein, it is 2 nanograms, 2 to 8 nanograms, what I normally read. 2 to 8 bhi, agar 2 se zada hai, to we like to use the augmentin te uh, augmentation test. What do you call it? As Acithem bolte hai na usko? Mm -hmm. Acithem. So just know in your own lab what is used and which is the value which is there. Yes, ma'am. Someone asked a bit more, I think, about the bone age. Um, just looking at the chats. So one thing is there, I've just checked, 21 hydroxylase is the correct enzyme, which is deficient due to which 17 hydroxy progesterone collects in blood. And when you augment, it is response to ACTH stimulation, which is uh, given in doses of, doses of, I'll have to see what doses are used for this. I think it is uh, 0.25 milligrams someone just read the augmentation test for this augmented 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone response to ACTH stimulation as evidence of decreased 21 hydroxylase activity in patients with delayed onset uh, CAH so I think these are offshoot questions primary amenorrhea is a very very long topic and very fortunately, you all got a very straightforward case. If it was a normal vagina, normal uterus, normal cervix, then we would have had a lot to discuss. But we have discussed all aspects. Tanya, I think they've done a very great job in explaining yeah. everything. Girls do not know so much about primary amenorrhea. Our students really read well. All what is important is, like Tanya said, that we have to do complete evaluation before we jump on to conclusions, including a chromosomal analysis of karyotype also for women, even with very clear-cut Rockintansky kusner hauser syndrome, because surprisingly, one of them might turn out to be testicular feminization. And always also say you would involve the multi, you know, you've got the MDT approach where you have the genetics team with you. For the young girls, always have a counselor to hand as well, because sometimes she may, again, remember this is just one aspect. Her emotional aspect is very important. 
sometimes they go through a lot of stress and anxiety and that adds in as well. You know that chronic stress, eating disorders, all of that, which is very common. We haven't touched upon that as well. So also have regular visits. Now it's sometimes difficult to keep having regular visits with the doctor, but have regular visits with the counselor there so that she's well supported. And as we say, this is something which needs regular input. So her needs at 15 would be different. Her needs at 20 would be different. Her needs in the reproductive age would be different and her needs later on would be different. So at every time we have to get her symptoms, what is bothering her the most and tailor the treatment accordingly. You girls did a very good history, lovely examination. And I think that was um, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so Thank much, you. Abha, ma'am and Tanya, ma'am. It was a very informative and interactive session. So uh, should we move upon to the next case? Yeah, please do. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. So after this case, we have a very important topic, which is, I think, we all of us uh, know and all of us has asked about it during our exam viva. We have drug class by Dr. Kanika Chopra. Ma'am is Assistant Professor, Obstetric Gynae, Lady Harding Medical College. And please, uh, ma'am, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Am I audible? Hello, ma'am. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Can I start my share? Uh, screen yes. sharing can be done by me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, ma please. Ma please. All right, all right. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Okay, so uh, I'll start my uh, topic. That is drugs and obstetrics. So what is important is that we should know um, how to present while presenting uh, if any one of us is asked about a particular drug. So I'm sure uh, I have tried uh, covering almost all the uh, drugs which are usually asked. If uh, some few are left, that can be read uh, by the uh, PGs. So first and foremost is, uh, let's start with folic acid. So why folic acid is important? Because uh, we should know what is its indication, what are the dosages uh, of it. Ma'am, ma 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 can you click, click the folic screen mode? Uh, yeah, the whole screen is... mode is clicked. Uh, is it yeah. visible now? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Perfect. So, uh, what is the mechanism? Of, uh, usually, when a drug is asked, what all things are asked? First is the mechanism of action of that particular drug. What are the indications? Then third comes the question is of the dosage. And then the side effects are the last question which are asked. So, supposedly, we are asked about folic acid. So, we should know what is its mechanism of action. That is, it stimulates normal erythropoiesis. And what are its indications? So the most important indication is highlighted. That is, it prevents neural tube defect in fetuses. Dosage, if asked, the dosage is different. For prevention of neural tube defects, it is 0.4 milligram per day. And it is given to all pregnant women, ideally one month before conception to three months after conception. And in women with history of neural tube defects or women who are on anti-epileptics, the dose is 4 milligram per day. And it is started three months before conception to three months after conception. Now, let's come on to another a very important class of drugs, which are antihypertensives. So, there are different antihypertensives that are used in pregnancies. These are labetalol, nifedipine, methyl dopa, hydrolyzine, nitroglycerine, and sodium nitroglyceride. So, we'll uh, learn about each drug uh, separately. So, labetalol. So labetalol, the mechanism of action is it is alpha-1 and a non-selective beta adrenergic blocker. And what is the dosage? So we have to start it with the lowest dose. That is, it is started at 100 milligram twice daily, 200 milligram three times a day. 
and it can be increased gradually to 2400 milligrams per day. So we should know the maximum dosage which is required in that particular drug. So this is the very important question asked in the viva. What is the maximum dosage you can give to a particular patient? And if we need to give IV infusion of the drug, we start with 20 milligram. We have to give IV. Slowly we give it, measure the BP after 10 minutes, and if the BP has not decreased to the level which is which is required for a particular patient, then we repeat the another dose. So another dose would be 20, 40 and the uh, third and fourth doses are 80, 80 each, which uh, combines to form a 220 milligram dose. So what are the side effects? Side effects can be headache. So uh, this headache, we should understand that if a patient is complaining of headache after giving an antihypertensive, there can be two incidences. She can be a sign of impending eclampsia. It can be a side effect of it. So we have to be very careful while uh, uh, taking that particular history of the patient. And it precipitates asthma. That is why it is very important. And history taking is also a very important uh, um, uh, aspect when even if we are prescribing a particular drug to the patient. Because there is a contraindication to give labitalol. What is that? It is asthma and a patient with heart failure. So in these two cases, we will not give labitalol to the patient. Supposedly, a patient comes to us. She is a case of preeclampsia. She And on examination, we find that her chest has crepes. We are suspecting that she is a case of pulmonary edema. We will not give labitalol to that patient. I am uh, sure I am making sense to everyone. <coughs> So what is the next dose? Next dose is nifetipine. So what is its mechanism of action? It has a direct arteriolar vasodilation by inhibition of slow inward calcium channel in vascular smooth muscles. So what is the dosage of it? We give 5 to 10 milligram and we start with twice daily to three times a day. And the maximum dose is, <coughs> maximum dose is a 60 to 120 milligram per day. So, uh, what are the side effects of it? <coughs> side effect is flushing, hypotension, headache. So, again, in if you are giving nifedipine to the patient, patient can again have headache. And another side effect of it is tachycardia. So, uh, all these things we have to uh, take care when we are prescribing such drugs and if there are side effects seen of them. What is the contraindication? So supposedly a nifetipine is required in a patient who is already on magnesium sulfate because she presented in such a way that she was a case of impending eclampsia and we have to give magnesium sulfate to the patient. We will not give nifetipine to the patient because of the simultaneous use can cause hazardous effect due to synergistic effect of both the drugs. So what is the second, uh, what is the third drug which comes into action? is hydralazine. Hydralazine, what is the mechanism of action? It is the peripheral vasodilation. What is the dosage of it? It's uh, We start with 100 milligram per day and usually it is given in four divided doses. And in cases of severe hypertension, uh, we have to give IV dose of it and we start at 5 to 10 milligram and we have to give every 20 minutes to a maximum of 30 milligram dose. Again, the side effects are hypotension, tachycardia, arrhythmias, palpitation and fluid retention and the side effects are related to its mechanism of action that is peripheral vasodilation. So we can understand, we can learn with the uh, side effects with the mechanism of action of that particular drug and contraindication, it uh, causes sodium retention. So diuretics have to be used when we are using hydralazine uh, along with it. So uh, the next dose is Next uh, drug is uh, nitroglycerin. So its mechanism, mechanism of action, it, it relaxes mainly the venous, but also the arterial smooth muscles. Dosage is we start with 5 microgram per minute. So uh, nitroglycerin is required in cases with severe preeclampsia or presenting with pulmonary edema. Because I've already said we cannot give labitalol to decrease blood pressure in such cases. So we start with nitroglycerin. We use infusion pump. Start with 5 microgram per minute and it has to be increased every 3 to 5 minutes up to 100 microgram per minute. Side effects of the drug is again tachycardia, headache, methemoglobinemia and contraindications are hypertensive encephalopathy. 
the uh, last uh, second last drug is sodium nitroprusside it also it uh, the mechanism of action is it causes direct arterial and venous vasodilator and iv infusion is started at the rate of 0.25 to 8 microgram per kg per minute the side effects of the drug is it causes severe hypotension and it can even cause cyanide toxicity the last drug is methyl dopa it's not available in market these days but the mechanism of action is central and peripheral anti anti adrenergic action so we should know for the purpose of theory so dosage which was used was orally we started with 250 mg twice daily dose to a maximum of 3000 mg per day one of the very important side effect was hemolytic anemia which it can cause and contraindications were in patients with hepatic di uh, disorders or in patients with congestive cardiac failure now we come on to oxytocin in patients uh, we know that oxytocin are required uh, uh, in various cases which helps in, in induction of labor in uh, uh, preventing postpartum hemorrhage and in even priming uh, the cervix so we'll read about them uh, gradually so first and foremost a very important drug which is used uh, in day to day practice of ours is oxytocin it is a non peptide synthesized in supra optic and paraventricular nuclei of hypothalamus and it is stored in posterior pituitary oxytocin we should all know has a half life of 3 to 4 minutes and its duration of action is approximately 20 minutes why should uh, uh, we know about the half life because supposedly oxytocin goes running the side effect of it is it can cause hypotonic contractions which can cause fetal distress but if we detect that the fetal distress is because of the oxytocin which has been rushed due to any reason if we stop oxytocin resuscitate the patient the effect of oxytocin gets reversed in 3 to 4 minutes so in that case it is no, uh, no point rushing a patient for uh, uh, rushing a patient for uh, a cesarean section we can wait Uh, calmly and just see the effect go off. So various synthetic preparations are available of that uh, of oxytocin, like centrosinone, which is most commonly available. Five units uh, are available in per uh, ml, and one one ml of that particular uh, ampule is available. So we should all know that uh, supposedly a drug is shown to us. we should know what is the ml in it and what is the uh, sub, uh, constituent in it for example a centrosinone vial is shown to us we should understand that it has 5 units in per ml and one ampule is 1 ml right other preparations are pitocin centrometrin centrometrin it is a combination of centrosinone 0.5 units and ergometrin 0.5 mg and there are oxytocin nasal solutions available as well so um uh, what is the mechanism of action is oxytocin it acts through a g protein right it acts through a g protein and uh, basically it uh, acts on the voltage gated calcium channels and initiates the myometrial contractions uses whenever asked it ha we have to uh, differentiate that uh, uses into when they are, uh, when the oxytocin is being utilized during the pregnancy phase when it is used after the delivery of the baby and how it is used in the puerperium phase so in pregnancy phase in early phases it is it helps to accelerate abortion cases to expedite expulsion of hydatiform mold to stop bleeding following evacuation of the uterus after we have done the abortion process and it is used as an adjunct to induction of labor in late it is again used to induce labor to ripen the cervix before induction augmentation of labor is most uh, commonly used indication of oxytocin and in cases of uterine inertia but we in cases of uterine inertia it has to be used very judiciously in labor cases active management of third stage of labor we all know that 10 international units im bolus is given after the delivery of the baby and in puerperium if you are thinking that a patient can is a high risk to have pph or she is developing pph we can use it for the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage as well the side effects in maternal cases are nausea vomiting arrhythmias uterine hyperstimulation as i discussed so if oxytocin goes running it can uh, the mother can have uterine hyperstimulation and in patients who are gravida 3 gravida 4 if we don't uh, take care of the oxytocin dosage being delivered to the patient the rate of oxytocin dosage even uterine rupture can happen 
Water intoxication happens because of its antidiuretic effect. And hypotension can happen if direct IV of uh, the oxytocin is given. That is why usually IV dose is not given. IM is given. And if IV is required, it is given in a diluted form. And in fetus, it can cause fetal distress because of uterine hyperstimulation. Contraindications are it is not given in patients with contracted pelvis because we know that in such cases, if it is given, it can cause uterine rupture. And definitely in malpresentation, the same thing goes. In case with obstructed labor or in fetal distress, we don't give oxytocin. And in patients with hypovolemia and with cardiac diseases, again, oxytocin is not recommended. Then ergot derivatives, there are two preparations available, ergometrin and methogen. So methogen is which is uh, the ampule which is available in our labor rooms. The dosage is 0 0.125 to 0 0.25 uh, milligram of ampule and the tablet is again 0 0.125 to 0.5 milligram. So mechanism of action is it acts directly on the myometrium and it produces uterine contractions. Indications are to stop atonic uterine bleeding following delivery, abortion, or expulsion of hydatiform mode. Side effects are hypertension due to vasoconstrictive action. So it has a generalized vasoconstrictive action. So because of that, hypertension can happen. And that is why the contraindications is cardiac disease in patients with severe preeclampsia and eclampsia and in patients with peripheral vascular disease. So it is very, very important to know what is the history of the patient? We should know about the past history. We should examine the patient properly and then only order any particular drug to the patient. Understanding what is the mechanism of action. Then comes prostaglandins. These are the prostanoic derivatives and they have the property of acting as local hormone. PG even uh, is a misoprostol. And PGE2 is a dinoprostol and PGF2 alpha is a carboprost. So what is misoprostol? Misoprostol is a very, very important drug. It is a methyl ester of PGE1 and it is available in tablet formulation. So it has an edge over other oxytocics. That is, it does not require a particular temperature for its storage. So in even in uh, PHCs and CHCs where deliveries are being conducted, misoprostol has an edge to prevent PPH and also in the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. And other uh, indications of it is, it is used uh, in the induction of abortion. It is used in the induction of labor. And it is uh, used in um, acceleration of labor and management of atonic PPH. Side effects are it causes uh, hyperstimulation of the uterus because of its mechanism of action and can even cause uterine rupture. It causes fever and chills as well. Contraindications are hypersensitivity to the drug and uterine scar. So if there is a previous cesarean patient, right, we cannot uh, give her misoprostol for the induction of labor. In that cases, for abortion cases, we can use uh, it. And uh, in that case also, we have to be very judicious. And uh, in cases with previous cesarean or previous hysterotomies, even with myomectomies, previous uh, misoprostol is contraindicated. So dinoprostol, which is a PGE2, it is available in gel formulation. Its mechanism of action, it is that it acts mainly on the cervix. Due to collagenolytic property, it causes dissolution of collagen bundles and increases submucosal water content of the cervix. Indication is it is used mainly in the induction of labor, but in cases of second trimester abortion where uh, we cannot give misoprostol, supposedly there's a previous three patient, previous three cesarean or a previous hysterotomy patient where uh, 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 mifepristone is not able to uh, cause the uh, 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 starting of abortion process. In that case, Avigel can be used. In And side effects are hyperstimulation. So, if a hyperstimulation happens with dinoprostone gel, what, what all things we can do? First, we can wash out that particular gel. And if, if that does not help, the drug of choice would be turbutaline. Then it can cause uterine rupture, especially if used in cases of previous cesarean. And it can also cause hypotension. And one of the contraindications of his use is hypersensitivity to the drug. 
So is there a provision of uh, uh, students asking question as well, Dr. Homa? Yes, ma'am. They have a chat box and a question and answer box. All right, all right. Okay. So uh, that uh, we can cater to it later or uh, um, yes, uh, in between? Yes, ma'am. After okay. your presentation, fine, fine. we can uh, look for it. All right, all right. So the other drug is carboprost. Carboprost, it causes strong uterine contractions by acting on membrane-bound calcium channels in the myometrium. So what is uh, its indication? It is used in the management of atonic PPH. So all the drugs which are used in the management of atonic PPH, there are two, three important things we should know. First is what are the contraindications, in which cases which drug cannot be used. And if you're using that particular drug, what is the dosage of it? And uh, and how many times that particular drug can be used? For example, in this case only, carboprost if used, 0.25 milligram is the dose. We can give it intramuscular and it can be repeated up to 8 times at an interval of 20 to 30 minutes. So maximum dose is 2 milligram. Side effect of the drug is diarrhea, nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. And its contraindications are hypersensitivity to the drug and bronchial asthma. All right. So, uh, uh, what one more important thing I would like to highlight is supposedly there's a patient who has presented to you with postpartum hemorrhage or she was with you admitted and she had postpartum hemorrhage and you saw when she went into shock due, due to hemorrhage, uh, due to extensive hemorrhage. In that cases, such drugs can be directly given into the uh, uterus. So, intramyometrial injection can be given because any drug, if given intramyometrial, intramuscular it requires a certain amount of blood flow so in a patient with shock these drugs if given im will not get absorbed it the mechanism actually will not turn up so either it can give it can be given directly intramuscular in, in the uterus or it can even be given intravascular now comes diuretics so diuretics we all know has very limited role in pregnancy so, uh, there are few indications and uh, these indications should be known by each and every postgraduate giving uh, the exam and also in in day-to-day -day practice because uh, we cannot give diuretics here and by to the pregnant patient because of its mechanism of action. So, what are the indications? Pregnancy-induced hypertension with pathological edema. Supposedly, this patient develops pulmonary edema and uh, severe anemia with heart failure presenting with uh, uh, severe anemia patients having heart failure and it has to be given in patients severe anemia in which we are giving blood transfusion so in that case we can give it either prior or we can give a mid bt uh, elastics as well to the patient so uh, the drug is furosemide it directly prevents reabsorption of sodium and potassium mainly from the loop of henley Dosage can range from 20 mg to 40 mg and indications we have already discussed. The side effects can be hypokalemia and postural hypotension among other side effects like weakness and cramps. Then comes tocolytic agents. So it's very important that all the PGs should know when a tocolytic agent has to be given to the patient. So in a patient who presents with preterm labor and delivery and we know that uh, it is important in that particular patient to delay the uh, uh, delivery due to any reason like uh, supposedly in that particular center, the uh, nursery facilities is not up to the mark that can uh, help the baby who delivers survive or we need to give uh, corticosteroids to the patient. So during that time, tocolytics is required. So commonly used drugs are nifedipine, beta myometics, indomethacin and magnesium sulfate as well. So um, importantly, nifedipine is available to us. It acts by blocking the entry of calcium inside the cells. Dosage is 10 to 20 milligrams. So usually we can give 30 milligrams stat dose to the patient. And then after every four hours, depending upon the uterine contractions, we can repeat the dose. Right. But most important thing is uh, we have to uh, monitor the vitals of these patients because they can have tachycardia, they can have hypotension because of the side effects of the drug. Contraindication is again, it should not be used in patients who are on magnesium sulfate because of the synergistic effect of the drug with the 
magnesium sulfate the other are beta mimetics like terbutaline ritodrine isosuprine uh, iso these drugs act through camp pathway and reduce the amount of free intracellular calcium leading to muscle relaxation dosage can be uh, supposedly the most common drug we uh, uh, use is terbutaline so that can be asked to you so subcutaneous injection of that is given 0.25 mg every 3 to 4 hours till the pain gets subsided all right again the side effects are headache palpitation tachycardia and they can cause pulmonary edema so we have to be very careful while giving terbutaline especially in patients who are at high risk to develop pulmonary edema and contraindications are cardiac diseases and diabetes another uh, very important drug is magnesium sulfate what is its mechanism of action it is a competitive inhibitor to calcium ions at the motor end plate leading to reduced calcium influx inside muscles. So, magnesium sulfate is a very important drug. It can be used as a tocolytic agent. It, it is a very important drug to prevent eclampsia as well and also in the treatment of eclampsia. Okay, so what is the dosage? Loading dose is 4 to 6 grams IV over 20 to 30 minutes followed by infusion of 1 to 2 gram per hour. So, usually 1 gram per hour is more than sufficient and we have to continue tocolysis for 10, 12 hours after the contractions have stopped. So, if there is an interactive session following uh, 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 my talk, I would like to ask few questions. Uh, if the PGs are interested, they can answer. So, side effects are uh, flushing, uh, which uh, many of you must have uh, noticed that when we are giving magnesium sulfate to the patient, patient complains ki garmi lag rahi hai because of this flushing side effect. They can have headache and they can have muscle weakness as well. So because of this, the contraindications are myasthenia gravis and impaired renal function. So we should all understand in a patient in which we don't know even uh, we don't know about the kidney status of the patient. In that patients as well, we can give complete loading dose when if required especially in cases of impending eclampsias or in eclampsias but if we get to know that her uh, uh, renal function is deranged we have to modify the dose or we have to stop the dose depending upon the derangement because the excretion of the magnesium sulfate is via the kidneys the other drug is indomethacin not very commonly used so we can skip this drug and atosiban, it is another very important drug uh, which is uh, being read very often uh, and it is the mechanism of action is that it is an oxytocin analog and it blocks myometrial oxytocin receptor. Doses is IV infusion of 300 microgram per minute and the side effects are nausea, vomiting and chest pain. Now comes the anticonvulsants. The anticonvulsants are like diazepam, phenytoin and the most important is magnesium sulfate, which I have already talked about. So there are different regimens which you can follow, Zospan, Pritchard, depending upon uh, uh, the uh, institution in which you are working and which uh, 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 protocol they are following. The most important is that if we are uh, giving magnesium sulfate, we have to monitor uh, the respiratory rate of the patient, we have to monitor the uh, tendon reflexes of the patient and we have to monitor the urine output to uh, ensure the magnesium toxicity does not happen. Then comes anticoagulants. They are used in pregnancy to prevent thromboembolic issues. So cardiac diseases, venous thrombosis and APLA syndromes are some of the indications for the use of um, uh, these uh, the drugs. So uh, one of the important is unfractionated heparin. So the mechanism of action, it, it inhibits factor 10A and thrombin and it increases factor 10A inhibitors. Dosage is 5,000 to 10,000 international units parenterally. And uh, DVT and pulmonary embolism cases, loading dose of 5,000 international units is given IV followed by continuous infusion. Um, continuous uh, infusion of 18 units per kg per hour. And in pregnancy, uh, uh, we can give uh, subcutaneously every 12 hours. And side effects are it can be hemorrhage, urticaria with long-term use, even thrombocytopenia, osteopenia and hyperkalemia can happen. The other uh, drug which is used is low molecular weight heparin. Inoxapenin is the uh, name by which uh, we know it. So mechanism of action is it is effective. Uh, it has longer half-life and once daily dose is convenient and it is uh, better as compared to unfractionated heparin because of its better uh, dosing regime. 
and it uh, standard doses do not require very vigorous monitoring so uh, dosage is 1 mg per kg twice daily subcutaneously we have to give a therapeutic dose of the same contraindications are known bleeding disorders antepartum hemorrhage or postpartum hemorrhage and very important being thrombocytopenia and severe renal disorder or liver disorder again uh, we have to uh, 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 don't give parents and uncontrolled hypertension like systolic blood pressure more than 200 or diastolic more than 120 and recent history of stroke then another is a warfarin, which is a, a mechanism of action. It, is, it, it interferes with the synthesis of vitamin K dependent factor. 5 to 10 milligram orally daily is given for initial two days, followed by 3 to 9 milligram daily depending on the PTINR values. Side effects are hemorrhage and warfarin embryopathy. So it is very important uh, in patients who are on warfarin and they conceive. Anti-D, we all know it is a drug to prevent uh, anti-D formation and it is most successful, successful if the medication is administered during antenatal period at around 28 weeks and again within 72 hours of delivery. So mechanism of action of anti-D is it blocks RH antigen of fetal cells and uh, uh, dosage, it depends upon the duration in which we are giving and the bleeding thing. So if uh, you, uh, uh, supposedly uh, we have to give 300 microgram per 30 ml fetal blood or 15 ml of uh, total RBCs. Uh, so if uh, uh, suppose there's a patient who has underwent an abortion and she's less than 13 weeks with no uterine bleeding. So the dosage is 50 micrograms IM and uh, in more than 13, 13 weeks gestation, it is 300 microgram IM. So indications we all know that it is to prevent ISO immunization in RH negative clients exposed to RH positive uh, uh, bloods because of MTP or abdominal trauma or bleeding during pregnancies. Then comes the anti-diabetic drugs. Insulin, we all know, it uh, has been considered as a standard therapy in women with GTM when target glucose levels cannot be consistently achieved through nutrition and exercise. It does not cross the placenta and tight glycemic control can be achieved with the help of it. A combination of short-acting insulin that is onset of action within 30 minutes lasting for 6 to 8 hours and intermediate-acting insulin like onset of action within 1 hour lasting for 10 to 14 hours insulin can be used. Indications to start insulin therapy in pregnancy is when the fasting blood sugar is more than 95 mg per deciliter or 1 hour post-prandial blood sugar is more than 140 or 2 hours is more than 120. So most important is that we have to start the therapy and achieve these values. So initial dose of insulin is 0.7 to 1 units per kg per day given in divided doses. So a starting dose can be calculated like pre-pregnancy, it is 0.6 units per kg per day. First trimester, it is 0.7 units. Second May, it is 0.8. Third trimester up to 34 weeks is 0.9 and term May, one unit per kg per day. An easy way is to calculate it uh, as per the blood sugar values of the patient. So supposedly the fasting levels has come out to be 120 and the post prandial is like 230. So we uh, uh, subtract the target values from this. Supposedly the uh, example, the post prandial is 230 and uh, we know, want uh, that uh, to our value uh, should be um, 120. So 230 minus 120 and whatever uh, the value comes, we divide by 30 milligrams and we get the unit uh, of the insulin which is required to neutralize that particular reason blood sugar levels. So 30 units is basically uh, 30 milligram uh, of the uh, glucose gets neutralized by one unit of uh, irregular insulin. So we have to titrate our insulin according to the blood sugar values and we can ask, uh, add in um, intermediate acting insulin depending upon the blood sugar values we get. So another uh, uh, very important drug is metformin, which is used as an oral hypoglycemic. So mechanism of action we should all know is that it suppresses the hepatic gluconeogenesis and glucose output from the liver. It enhances the insulin-mediated glucose uptake in skeletal muscles and fat and interferes with mitochondrial respiratory chain and promotes peripheral glucose utilization. And dosage, again, we have to alter depending upon the blood sugar values of the patient. So we can start with the minimal dose and increase the dose uh, as per the blood sugar values of the patient. 
now a uh, few drugs which are used in day to day practice in gynecology norethestrone it's a first generation progesterone dose starts with 5 mg thrice daily or we can give even a 10 mg sustained release dose of it uses can be contraception severe amenorrhagia as in endometriosis and because of uh, uh, because of its effect it has a better hemostatic effect side effects are androgenic side effects which is the most uh, important side effect of it another is a medroxy progesterone acetate it's a progesterone with less androgenic side effect doses again can be uh, altered depending upon uh, the uh, uh, cause uh, depending upon uh, the indication in which we are using it so usually we start with the uh, 10 mg tablet or even at low doses depending upon the indication uses in hormone replacement therapies in patients with abnormal uterine bleeding in withdrawal bleeding which uh, uh, is one of the indication in which it is used the other drug is a mirena which is a levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine device 52 mg of levonorgestrel is the constituent of it and it releases 20 microgram per day mechanism is endometrial shedding of uh, the uh, because of the levonorgestrel it causes endometrial shedding it can be used in uh, most important uses in patients with abnormal uterine bleeding especially associated with endo um, uh, with adenomyosis and in patients with endometrial hyperplasia without atypias then mala n it is a combined oral contraceptive pill it is available free of cost at government hospitals formulation being levonorgestrel 0.15 mg and ethanol estradiol 30 mg one pill is every day given from and it can be started from day 2 or 3 of the menstrual cycle for 21 days followed by 7 day placebo or it had, basically it has iron tablets or uh, which are which can also be known as placebo tablets and uses as contraception menorrhagia polymenorrhea dysmenorrhea endometriosis and uh, side effects are like weight gain and it can even cause breakthrough bleeding if not taken at proper time Clomiphene citrate is uh, one of the very common ovulation induction agents. I'm sure these drugs are uh, being uh, these drugs are discussed in chapters with uh, in uh, discussions with infertility and so so that is why I've not covered almost all, of uh, all the drugs which are used in infertility and with abnormal uterine bleeding. So these uh, are the ovulation inducing agents. Mechanism is anti estrogen causing stimulation of hypothalamus. Pituitary with rise in FSH causing stimulation of follicles. The dose is fifty milligram, um, starting from day two to day six for five days. And side effects is uh, hot flushes, headache, hyperstimulation, and it can cause multiple pregnancies as well. So, um, this is all from my side. Any questions can be answered. Ma'am, ma there, there, there is some question in chat box. Please check. Yeah, I'm answering them. I'm answering them. I've answered my ma'am. Explain about augmentation with oxytocin. Okay, so augmentation with oxytocin it depends upon the indication in which uh, we are using it. Supposedly, uh, there are regimes. Uh, there are different regimes. Low dose, high dose. So low dose regime is usually started. and uh, supposedly a previous cesarean patient is getting augmented so we have to uh, give a different regime to, to that particular patient so maximum dose it is said that um, uh, uh, suppose it, so it basically depends upon uh, the indication in which we are using it and we have to titrate the dose according to that so there is no like maximum limit of that particular uh, oxytocin ma'am another question is about carbitocin Mm, I can't see that question. What no, is the uh, question? It's in the Q and A box, ma'am. Can you discuss about carbitocin? How different from oxytocin? So carbitocin, uh, it is a drug which is, uh, um, uh, it has a similar mechanism of action as oxytocin, but carbitocin is only used as a. uh it can it is not used in the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage it can be used as a substitute to oxytocin and uh, the advantage of carbitocin over oxytocin is that it is heat stable agent so it does not require a refrigeration like oxytocin so uh, this is the it is diff, this is how it is different from oxytocin um another question is ma'am uh 
cyanometrin contains 0 0.5 or 5 centosinon? Centometrin. Ah. Centometrin contains what? I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear. Uh, centometrin contains 0 0.5 or 5 unit of centosinon. 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And uh, how magnesium sulfate related to decrease urine output? Is it excreted in urine? Then how it is related? No, no, it's not related to it. It can cause uh, toxicity. So if there is a patient with uh, renal uh, disease and uh, urine output starts decreasing, so this means the excretion of magnesium sulfate starts decreasing and it can cause toxicity because of that, because of the increased accumulation of magnesium sulfate in the body. So you can understand that way. Okay. Another question is, is magnesium sulfate contraindicated in pulmonary edema? No, no, it's not contraindicated. And uh, doses of isosprin post-circlage? So that I cannot comment on. It depends upon uh, the person. It uh, There is no particular dosage of it. So you should know that isosoprine can be given. So uh, you can give depending upon uh, your regime per se. There is no particular dosage of it. And another question is, dose of oxytocin for second trimester MTP? For second trimester MTP, we usually start with high dose. So we start with 5 uh, units and we titrate to 10 units, 5 units, 30 drops. And we titrate gradually to 10 units, 30 drops, 60 drops and uh, so and so forth depending upon the uh, depending upon how the uh, uterus is responding to that particular dose. So, high-dose regime can be started in second trimester abortions. And another question is, can you please repeat how to calculate insulin dose? Yes. Uh, so, uh, example, the fasting dose of a patient, fasting uh, blood sugars of the patient comes out, uh, comes out to be 195. And uh, the uh, 2R value comes out to be 220. Example. So, 195 minus 95 would be 100. So, 100 has to be divided by 30. So, uh, a maximum, you can understand that this would be like 3 units of insulin. So, what is the uh, expectant value when we start insulin would be fasting 95 and uh, 2R would be 120. So, jitna bhi 120 se 2R zyada hoga, usko hume subtract karke, 30 se divide karna hai, utna hamara uh, insulin ka dose ho jayega and usi ke according we have to titrate the dosages. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Am I making Another sense or should I repeat is... again? No, no. It was clear. I think Tiki ma'am has also discussed the same thing. Okay, ma'am, okay. uh, what is the maximum dose of oxytocin during PPH and how to taper it? Okay, so maximum dosage of... Uh, it is 20 international units. Uh, uh, maximum is 40. So, you have to give 40. You cannot go above 100. One should understand we cannot go above 100 international units at one in 24 hours because it can cause water intoxication. So if we are uh, dealing with the case of PPH, once we have uh, given an active management, we have given already 10 to the patient and we start with 40 international units and we cannot give 40, uh, 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 supposedly we can divide it into two, 500 ml we give 20 and we uh, started at the rate of 60 drops per minute and in another uh, VAC again we give 20 and uh, continue it at 60 drops per minute and if we have controlled PPH, we have to continue it at a slow rate that the oxytocin continues for another 1 to 2 hours. Okay, ma'am. I think we are done with all the questions in the chat box as well as in the Q&A section. Right. So, uh, okay, we have a maximum dose of methurgen. Ma'am has already answered five doses. I think we are done with the session, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a very elaborative session in a 30 minute time you have covered almost all the drugs that we Thank you so much. get during our exam uh, so i think we should uh, end the session now yeah definitely yeah, I think the thank, you so much, thank, thank you so much thank you so much ma'am thank you so much and uh, let's uh, gather tomorrow for another the third day of the academic feast of Gurukul classes. So let's end the day for now. Thank you all. Thank you, Kanika ma'am. Thank you.
थैंक यू डियर थैंक यू बाय बाय मैम गुड नाइट